particular, we're looking at verses two and three uh, this week. Well, I don't know how you feel about this year. Uh, many of us seem to be wishing that it was over and that it's next year already. Although, to be honest, I'm not sure next year is going to be much different, really. But we'll see. Uh, I suppose for many of us, we, we're finding this year has been tiring. Uh, we've had to change the way we work, the way we live. We have to remember to take a mask wherever we go. Uh, and as we approach Christmas, especially for teachers and for children as well, we just feel like we've had enough. You know, we're tired. We kind of want it to be over. We're looking forward to that Christmas time. We want a break. Well, I hope that's not how we feel about Jesus. You know, perhaps some of us feel maybe the church just makes too much about Jesus. What is the big deal about Jesus? Perhaps even as Christians, our delight in Jesus just isn't that great anymore. We don't get as excited about him as we used to do. Perhaps many of us are just going through the motions of our faith. Perhaps some of us have considered giving it all up. That can be a danger, especially if we've taken our eyes off Jesus. We haven't looked at him and beheld him recently. This is what Hebrews, the, the letter to the Hebrews, deals with. It reminds us just how great Jesus is. Uh, the writer is urging us to keep on going. So in chapter 12, the writer says, this is my paraphrase, he says, get rid of that sin that's bogging you down and slowing you down. Let's run the race before us with endurance. Look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of your faith. Consider him who endured so that you won't grow weary. So it's consider him, look to him, fix your eyes upon him. That is the answer to, for those of us who are feeling weary and drab and like we've lost the, the last of, of Jesus. We fix our eyes upon him. That's how the writer starts uh, the letter to the Hebrews, by fixing our eyes upon Jesus. So he's already said in verse one, he says, how, how long ago God spoke through the prophets. But then he says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So who else are we going to listen to? Where else are we going to go? If God has spoken through his son, why, why would we start to look elsewhere? As he begins his letter, the writer wants us to get off on the right foot. It's going to remind us just how great the Son of God is. I don't think many people really enjoy putting together a CV. Um, I certainly don't. Um, it seems especially difficult as Christians, I think. Uh, because we, we're kind of used to trying to be quite humble. And so the idea of trying to write this thing down about saying how great you are, you know, look at me, I'm wonderful. It just seems a bit odd, doesn't it? You know, look at, you know, look at how amazing I am. Look at how I can stack shelves. I'm like, oh, wow. You know, it's just like, it just seems against who we are. But this is kind of what the writer is doing here. He's, he's giving us, he's writing us a CV for the son of God so that in our busy stressful lives with all the different things around us saying no you need to ignore that you need to come over there you to be too busy for Jesus so that in that midst of the busy world our, our eyes are focused back on Jesus and we're going to look at five of the statements from this so-called CV of the son of God really just looking at verses two and three so firstly at uh, the uh, halfway through verse two Christ is the heir of all things. It sounds like the stuff of a Disney movie. A beautiful princess falls in love with an affable but poor guy. He's a commoner. She's royalty. He's not worthy of her. But then near the end of the story, um, after she's proved willing to give up everything for him, he discovers he is, in fact, due to inherit a title and great wealth, and everything ends happily ever after. I'm sure that's a story that's been retold many times uh, throughout the history of the world, um, in one way or another. 
Uh, the story of Jesus isn't really quite like that, but there are some similarities to it. So on earth, Jesus was poor. He didn't appear to have anything. And to us, the idea of Jesus being able to speak into our sophisticated scientific society, it might seem a little bit daft, you know. It's almost like a poor man writing a book on how to become rich. I mean, what does he know? If he knows so much, why was he poor? Can we really entrust ourselves to someone whose footwear was no more sophisticated than a sandal? Can we entrust our, our future to someone that didn't even have a pension plan or savings? Do we dare entrust ourselves into the hand of this poor first century teacher who was rejected and killed by his own people? But then, of course, that's not all there is to Jesus, is it? Jesus was poor on earth, but don't let that fool you. You see, in reality, what, what does he say there? He says he is the heir of all things. All things. That means everything. Everything will be his. If we just look at his earthly circumstances, we might conclude, well, he's not really in a position to help anyone, but we're really missing who he actually is, the heir of all things. People might be tempted to laugh at Jesus now and consider him as irrelevant or the time he lived in as, as, as primitive but everything that has ever existed will belong to him and we might think well doesn't it already belong to him well yes in a way but at the moment it's still in rebellion to him because he, he's waiting patiently to give everyone the opportunity to come to him in mercy and be forgiven that's why he delays his return he's waiting he's giving us you a chance to repent and be saved but there will come a time when his kingdom fully comes and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will come a time when all rebellion ceases and all things come into peaceful, harmonious submission to him. This is the goal of all creation. We need to be aware of that. This is what creation is heading towards. There will be a time when the world will see the Lord. We will see he is worthy. I can't fight it any, anymore. He is worthy. Uh, and, and actually, for those of us who know him, we will delight in him. The, and we are meant to come to the point where we delight in the son as much as the father delights in him. This is what the, the aim of the world is, to glorify the son. It's not actually about me getting rich. It's not actually about me living a comfortable life and God taking care of all my particular needs actually it is about the greatest thing ever it is about coming to know the worth and value and beauty of the son so that we join with all creation in a worship and adoration of him which by the way will be the most joyful thing ever you won't be sitting there thinking well this is a bit boring you will be so taken up with the greatness of this son it will be the greatest thing ever we have a glorious life to look forward to. Those in Jesus will be with God's beloved son, and he is the heir to all things. There will be nothing that we are in want of. We won't be sitting there thinking, well, you know, it's a shame we haven't got that. He is the heir of all things. So there's much to keep us going for. But, but don't, just don't miss this. If all things are his, that includes you and me. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And it might be surprising to some of us to realize I'm not my own, because we kind of think of me as belonging to me. But actually, if we're in Christ, if he's paid the price for us, if he's redeemed us, we, we already belong to him. We are the first fruits of that new creation. So if I belong to him, that's going to impact the way I live, isn't it? I can't just live for me with no regard to him. I belong to him. I wonder how you feel if you um, were introduced to one of the richest people in the world. 
Jeff Bezos, I don't know if I pronounced that right, apparently there's lots of confusion about how to pronounce it. Bill Gates, Elon Musk. I think if I have one of those three rich men standing next to me now, I, there would be a certain amount of awe, wouldn't there? Like, oh, you know, you're like one of the richest men in the world. But you know, their combined wealth of those three richest men is nothing compared to the one who inherits all things, the entire universe, everything. So why is Jesus so special? Well, here's reason number one, because he is the heir to all things, including us, me. So we should be in awe of him and we should live for him. Reason number two, he created everything. There's something in our society that doesn't really like people becoming vastly rich um, through doing nothing. We don't seem to like that. We, we insultingly say they were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And we may look at the rich, the aristocracy, and think, well, what have they done to deserve that? You know, it's not really fair. It's not really right. Perhaps we just say that out of jealousy because we'd actually quite like to be in that situation. But we don't like someone getting something for nothing. Uh, but can the same be said for Jesus, the Son of God, who's going to get all things? Is he getting something for nothing? Actually, no. It's only right that this Son is the heir of all things. Look at the second thing on the CV, uh, at the end of verse 2. Through whom also he created the world. Does the writer really mean that? Well, it agrees with the rest of the New Testament. 1 John 1, 3, all things were made through him. This is the son. And without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16, all things were created through him and for him, for him. So he's there, all things there as well. You've got both things there. Uh, now, I, I know we probably thought that the world was created by the father. And it was. But he did it through his son by his Holy Spirit. A creation involved the one triune God with each person of the Trinity involved in a particular way. And, and just because it boggles our minds and we don't really understand how it all works, it doesn't mean it's not true. Do you know, I don't understand how my computer works. It does. I don't understand how electricity works. Thankfully it does. See, I don't even understand how my own body works, and it mostly does. God the Father is the creator. He created everything that has been made through his son. So what the son will possess, he was instrumental in making. Now, the, the word for world there at the end of verse 2 is actually plural. That's why the NIV translates it as universe, because it's worlds, uh, not just world. It's the universe. The Greek word there, but it also means ages. It's quite a rich word. It means ages or all the times or eternity. So it's like the worlds, the ages. Uh, so scholars think what's being said here is that through the sun, all of space and time were created. This is huge, isn't it? This is absolutely huge. So when we ask, well, who is this son? You know, why is he so special? Why did the church make such a fuss about him? Well, it's because he's your creator. He made you. If it wasn't for him, you and I, and all of time and space, it wouldn't exist. And no matter what you think, whether you agree with that or not, that is what the Bible clearly states. So he actually has a right to inherit all things because he made all things he wasn't just the lucky one born with a silver spoon in his mouth what he has made and then has rebelled against him gone away from him actually he brought back with the blood his own blood has redeemed us and all things will be brought back to him so he's made all things he will in inherit all things that cv is looking quite impressive so far i would suggest certainly better than mine but thirdly he is the radiance of the glory of God. Glory can be a tricky concept to try and understand. So let's just look at a few examples from scripture. In Exodus chapter 16, 
the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. In Exodus uh, 26, the Lord invited Moses to come up to Mount Sinai. He received the tablets, the stone with the, the commandments on. In verse 16, we course, how the glory of the Lord dwelt there. Uh, and it talks about a cloud, and then it describes the glory of the Lord as a devouring fire. And then in Exodus 40, we see a cloud covers the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. These are all expressions of the glory of the Lord. So to the Hebrews, the glory of the Lord was a visible expression um, of the presence of God. The glory of the Lord was a visible expression of the majestic presence of God. Here's how some other people have tried to define God's glory. So Tim Chester says, it's the sum of all his perfections, his perfect love, his perfect power, his perfect justice, his perfect goodness, perfect patience, perfect wisdom, wisdom and so on. It's all of those things brought together on display. Robert Murray uh, says the glory of God is the majestic and I'm sorry, the majesty of God. It's the sum of all his perfections. Again, so you can see where Chester got that from. Don Carson says it's the manifestation of all that God is. It's his absolute reality. John Piper says it's the radiance of God's holiness, the beauty of God's holiness. So, so you can see they're all sort of circling around the same, same ideas. It's quite hard to actually pin down precisely what it is. But, it, but it's the idea of his glory. It's, it's the outshining, the expression of who God is. And here we see the radiance, the outshining of, of his glory is Christ. He is the majestic presence of God. He radiates God's perfect love, his perfect power, his justice, his goodness, his patience, his wisdom. Back in the Old Testament, when Moses asked God to show him his glory, the Lord said to Moses, you can't see my face and live. So God covered him as, as he passed by, as his glory passed by. And as that glory passed by, God spoke and he said, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithful. So he was revealing his glory as he revealed his, his character so to see God's glory is to see who God really is and it, it's the humbling awesome beautiful wow factor of God made visible Christ is the outshining of all that God is Jesus says whoever has seen me has seen the father why is that significant Well, because now God doesn't have to hide us away in the cleft of the rock as he comes near. In Jesus, we can see the glory of God. We can see who God is. We can see what he's like, how worthy he is, how wonderful he is. We can be in his glorious presence and live. So the unapproachable has been made approachable. So the sun is the radiance of God's glory. There is no one else like him. Fourthly, and very closely related, he is the exact imprint of his nature. Uh, due to COVID um, this year, we had to abandon our much anticipated holiday to the Canary Islands. Instead, we joined the multitudes of Brits who suddenly needed to find an alternative holiday plan. And, uh, you know, like everyone else, I went on the internet and I found the caravan and um, uh, everyone had hiked their prices up. And so I thought, that's a lot of money to pay for a caravan. But I looked at the pictures and the pictures look pretty impressive, to be honest. You know, um, the, the brochure pictures, they look good. The, the rooms looked almost palatial, especially for a caravan. I thought this is going to be good. And all I can say is once we got there, it's amazing the difference a wide angle lens can make. I didn't feel that the pictures were a true representation of what we finally um, had. However, when we come to the nature of the sun, there is no exaggeration or enhancing or embellishing. He, in verse three, he is the exact, exact imprint of God's nature. This is 
drawing imagery from the idea of the, the ancient blacksmith. So to make a coin, you would have a die with an image and you would hammer the, the disc over it to make that exact representation of that image. So when we look at the sun, we see exactly what the father is like. Does this mean that the sun is not God? No, it shows us exactly what the father is like, and yet it shows us that he is distinct. So he is exactly like the father, and yet he is distinct. Now, all this is mysterious, and we are treading on holy ground here. But in case we think this threatens uh, the divinity of the son, fear not, because he quickly carries on. He says, of his nature, of his nature, the Greek word there for nature is hypostasis. It means the essence of an entity. So this is quite theological, isn't it? Uh, but it means it's, it's nature, it's actual being, the essence of a, a being. It is the godness of God, if you like. So the son is one with the father. He is of the same essence. He is God of God, and yet he is distinct from the father. They share the same essence. They are the same being, but not the same person. So when we look at the son, we see the exact representation of the father because they are one and they share the same nature, but they are distinct. So we see Jesus is God in human form. But what is this? What does this mean then, that, that Jesus is God in human form? What does this mean for us here? Well, it means when we look at Jesus, we see what God is like. We see Jesus welcomes sinners. We see Jesus invites the little children who were seen as the, the unimportant in the world. He says, let them come to me. Uh, we see Jesus has mercy. He has compassion. We see he loves, he forgives. He has time for the people that other people just don't have time for. We see in Jesus the heart of the Father, because the heart of the Son and the heart of the Father are the same. He is the exact imprint of his nature. He's not some photoshopped version of God just to make us all think God's really good. He is God. He is what God is like, compassionate, kind, merciful, faithful, and loving. This is what our God is like. This is what Jesus came to reveal to us when he took on flesh and became like us. But lastly, he also upholds the universe. If you've um, seen any of the, the Marvel cinematic universe you know the, all the movies they've released they're all strung together with interconnecting parts there and it all comes to two climatic films and and if you've seen them you'll be aware that the in that those films the bad Thanos, he extinguishes half of the living uh, beings in the universe with just a click of his finger that wasn't a very good click that's better yeah, with a click of his finger and half of the the life of the universe perishes just like that and then the, the camera cuts to all around the world of people just dissolving into this brown, dusty ash, uh, just disappearing. It's this very eerie scene, actually. I wonder if that's similar to what would happen if the sun stopped holding the universe together. Colossians 1 says, in him, all things hold together. Here in Hebrews, uh, halfway through verse 3, says that he upholds the universe by the word of his power, uh, undermines his, his divinity. He's upholding the universe by his power of his word. Uh, the NIV says, by his powerful word. Uh, so you see the Trinity, uh, in the Trinity, each person has got a different role. And, and here we glimpse one of the roles of the Son. It is not only to be working in creation, uh, but it's not only that he's going to inherit it all, but actually he's holding it all together. So what would happen if he stopped holding it all together? What would happen if he woke up one, not leave my sleep, but if he said, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Well, I don't know. Would it be a, a gradual wind down? Would just the laws of physics and nature just stop, stopped applying? Would we just disappear like in that film, just turning to, to ash like we never existed? I don't know. But you know, the good thing is it's never going to happen. <laughs> Because since creation, the sun has been sustaining it. 
and he's told us how it's all going to end. So we don't have to think, well, what if he changes his mind? He won't. He's faithful. He's told us how it's going to end. And even as a baby in that manger, his divine nature was still active. It didn't cease. He did become fully human, but he didn't cease to be fully God. He was fully God and fully human. He emptied himself of divine privileges, but it was nevertheless still fully God. And it's a good job. Otherwise, the universe, he came to save and redeem, it would have ceased to exist. So he holds all things together. This is what the sun does. I don't know if you're a fan of the uh, novels from authors such as Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters, the sort of texts you had to read for A-level English and all those sorts of things. Maybe, maybe you read them for, for pleasure. I, I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the stories seem to me, I mean, I failed English, so who am I to speak? But the stories seem to me um, to be all about uh, marriage. And the, these young women, they have to find a su suitable person to marry. The parents are, are looking for someone with a good name. They're looking for, for someone who's got a good inheritance and a good reputation. They need their, their daughters to marry well, otherwise it's going to be uh, difficult times ahead. But of course the daughters are all more romantic, they're more interested in love, and they want to find a guy that they actually like. But here's the thing, when we come to Jesus, when we're coming to him and think, well who am I going to commit my life to? Because you know that's going to affect my future, we don't have to choose. As if like, oh, I, I like that thing there, but I really want that thing. Or that thing's better for me, but over there I know I should really do that. When it comes to Jesus, actually we find he's special enough. That actually uh, we can trust him with our lives. We can trust him with our death and with our eternity. We don't have to choose between someone we like and someone we don't like. It's, we don't have to compromise and think, well, actually, I really want to go and do that stuff. But I, but I know I should do that. Because actually in Jesus, we have everything. We have the complete package. So can he provide for us in our lives, in our death, in eternity? Can he provide for us? He's the heir of all things. <laughs> Is he a hard worker? Does he know what it's like to get his hands dirty? He created all things. But what about his appearance? Does it leave something to be desired? He is the radiance of the glory of God. He is wonderful. We're never going to be looking at him and saying, well, that's, that's a shame. He is awesome. What about his character, though? He is exactly like his father. He's perfect. He defines love. But is he strong enough? Can he protect us? Will he look after us? Do you know, even in this messed up world and into eternity, he is upholding the entire universe. And since he is holding the entire universe, all the creation together, I think that he can cope with you and me and our problems, no matter how big they are. So what is so special about the sun? As it turns out, pretty much everything. That's why we celebrate the sun's arrival on Earth. That's why it's just so mind-boggling when we see that this great sun was born as a baby. That's why we celebrate. That's why we worship. That's why we adore him. And that's why if you're feeling weary in your faith, if your faith is feeling flat and you think, oh, I just need to get to the end of this, what we are to do is to fix our eyes upon Jesus, to remember who he is, because there is no one like him. We're going to take up that theme in our final song, um, O Come, All You Faithful. So when we're ready, we'll join together in worship to behold our God.